Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 48. I'm going to read this in ESV, and you may have different versions from what I have, uh, but you can just read along. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And be like men who are waiting for his master to come uh, come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door. So, so they, they, they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had, had known what, uh, at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his, man, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that, is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come uh, on, a, uh, on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he does not know, and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who, who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. Word of God. Amen. Uh, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we want to lift up your name as we uh, open this time. Father God, I do ask that you would just come down upon us tonight. And speak to us. First of all, uh, Lord, would you just cover us up with the precious blood, precious blood of Jesus Christ, your Son? Cleanse us. Would you purify us? Would you sanctify us? And draw us closer to you. Help us to enter your throne. Father, I do ask that you would just anoint us with your Holy Spirit and reveal your heart to us tonight. Lord, would you uh, open up our eyes? Would you open up our hearts as we come near you? I give this time into your hands, and in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Um, as we open up this time, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, my name is Daniel Kim. Uh, some people know me as Missionary Daniel Kim or Reverend Pastor uh, Re uh, Daniel Kim. Uh, if I were to just give you a little background information of uh, just who I am, uh, it's probably better uh, to begin with the uh, first 10 years of my life. I was born in Korea, I was actually raised in Korea until I was 10. And you're going to probably think, okay, that's when he came to the U.S., not yet. Um, at age 10, I actually moved to Japan, where my father was born and raised. So I grew up in Japan, I'm not Korean American, I'm not Korean Japanese, yeah, in a way I'm Korean Japanese, but people call me actually a, a TCK, a third culture kid. And I thank all the sociologists, they, they actually came up with a change of microphone, I guess. Yeah, I guess this is better, right? All right, less echoing. Um, yeah, I want to thank all the sociologists. They actually came up with this term, uh, TCK. So I'm a TCK. I was born in Korea. I lived in Korea, Korea until I was 10. And I left Korea when I was 10 years old uh, to go to Japan, where my father was born and raised. And I lived in Japan uh, for 10 years. I lived in Japan for 10 years. And I, uh, 
instead of attending a Korean school or a Japanese school, I, okay, this is going really bad. All right. Um, I attended an American school in Japan. That's where I picked up my English. And, uh, you know, graduating from high school uh, in Japan and wrapping up my 10 years of my life there, I decided to come to the U.S. Um, the following 10 years, the third chapter of my life, I spent in the U.S. Uh, first four years, I actually uh, went down to Charleston, South Carolina, the old capital. And it's, it has a lot of dark history there. And uh, I actually spent four years there in Charleston attending the Citadel uh, Military College of South Carolina. And that's, you probably know that school for uh, hazing and racism. And uh, it's pretty famous for that. Um, uh, that's where I attended school for four years. And as soon as I graduated, I left Charleston uh, to go up to Chicago uh, for a seminary. And I uh, attended Trinity for six years, uh, uh, doing two years of my uh, full-time ministry as an EM pastor uh, during those six years. And uh, after 10 years of my life in the U.S., I was ordained as a pastor, ordained, ordained as a reverend, and I was sent out to the mission field. And it's been eight years uh, since I was actually sent out. I've been working out there in the mission field. So I know what you're thinking, uh, he's probably young. He looks really, really young. He looks like he's in his, in his 20s or something. But thank you very much, but I know I, I, I look pretty young, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be training th uh, 37 uh, next year. Um, I've been spending uh, probably about um, eight years out in the mission field. This is my eighth year, in fact. Um, I, uh, when I, whenever I share um, that I am from the, uh, I'm, I'm actually a missionary, people actually ask me this question. They say, um, where are you stationed? Uh, what kind of people groups are you reaching out to? Um, I don't think I'm gonna have enough time to really um, uh, go into much detail about what I do out there in the mission field, but I can tell you these things. I am, I actually, instead of God, um, giving me one specific uh, people groups or a, a country for me to reach out to. What God has given me um, are two stepping stones. One stepping stone is um, Beijing to reach out to the West. Um, and God has also given me um, Seoul and Incheon <coughs> city to reach out to the East. What I, what I mean by West is um, anything that's on the West side of Beijing, which is China, um, uh, India, Mongolia, Russia, Central Asia, and, you know, Central Asia like Afghanistan, Pakistan, Pakistan is kind of in the middle somewhere, um, uh, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Turkey, all the stands, you know. And then and, uh, the Middle East, and there's Africa, and then all the way up to Jerusalem, Israel. That includes my uh, um, East, uh, Western ministries. My Eastern ministries has to do with it has to do with anything that's on the east of Korea, which is, which has to do with Korea, Japan, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, and everything up to London. Everything that includes all the European countries. Um, this side, Western countries, uh, Western countries, anything that's on the west of Beijing. It's underground ministries, that's where the persecution is. Uh, anything that comes on the east side, that's where the gospel has already traveled to, and that's where the churches are. Those are the places where I can do open preaching on the pulpit and not get persecuted for that. So I go back and forth between the east and west, going above the ground and underground, um, and that's where my ministry is. And as far as, far as um, any more detail, um, if you want, if you want, to, if you want to um, just come and join us tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon, uh, probably uh, we'll take you, <coughs> we'll take you um, a little further into uh, what what I do out there in the mission field. But for tonight, I just want to share uh, a passage from the Bible, um, the passage passage that that we just read, and tonight's passage has to do with preparing. Uh, for the 80, uh, for the last eight years uh, that I spent out, the, out there in the mission field, I realized one thing. Um, I met different people. I met. I've, I've traveled to different places. I've done different types of missions. I've uh, gone to different churches to preach. But there's one thing that's been just carved into my heart. When I when I went out there, sent out from the U.S., God was so boldly speaking to me through so many circumstances that His return date is imminent. 
And these are the things that um, we, we forget oftentimes living in this Western world. Because we're so comfortable with our culture, culture of Christianity. Many times we're so comfortable with what we're used to. And when, when you actually encounter the message that you're not used to it, we feel, we feel very uncomfortable. And we, we have these tendencies, tendencies to just dismiss those messages, whether, whether that's the truth or not. But God is telling me throughout my, uh, throughout my last eight years of ministry, uh, his, eminent, uh, he, he, his date of return is becoming very imminent. It's drawing very near. And he's telling us one thing, prepare. Amen. He's not coming to just uh, to you know, take, take us home, but he's actually coming as the ultimate judge. He's coming to differentiate between the, the truly saved and acting like, you say, acting like you're saved. He's actually coming to judge between the quick and the dead, people who actually have the life of Jesus Christ in them, or people who's acting like they have life of Jesus Christ in them. There's a big difference. The true church and the false church. So, where do we belong? As we begin tonight's message, um, God's telling us three things. This, the, these are the three ways that we can prepare ourselves. Number one, stay awake. Number two, manage. Number three, serve. Statement number one, stay awake until the end. Number two, manage with the heart of the master. Number three, serve as much as you, as much as you have received. So there are three things we can examine. How do we prepare? Number one, stay awake until the end. That's what the, that's what the Bible says. Let's actually open up our Bibles, not close it until the end of the message because I'm not speaking just you know, on my own. But I, uh, I, I really hope to bring the Word of God uh, to this place tonight. So if you could open up your Bibles, if you haven't closed it, it's okay. Um, Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 40. Let's read this again. I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, for, for, for you to read it, all right? I read it earlier, and I'm going to give you uh, an opportunity for you to read this time. Uh, verses 35 to 40. Let's read this together. Uh, God's telling us to stay awake until the end. Ready? Go. Verse 40, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour we do not expect. Amen. Uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting if you read in Korean, um, people actually read in unison and in, in English, it's really hard to uh, bring everybody together because everybody has different versions. But um, let's try harder next time. Philadelphia is kind of submissive, pretty quiet here. But, uh, well, no, not yet. <laughs> uh, well, um, I, uh, this is my 10th day in the U.S. It's definitely good to be back. And uh, somebody actually asked me today, so if you were to choose one place where you want to live, anywhere in the world, where would you live? And I must say that I, I've been to so many, you know, I've been to different places in the world for the last eight years. Uh, I never stayed in one location for more than 10 days at a time. Um, so I'm used to packing up and leaving, packing up and leaving, you know, that's, that's my life. And right before the U.S. trip, I actually um, came through um, Toronto, Kingston, and went to Korea, stayed there for three days, and came out to um, Beijing, um, Dubai, uh, Jordan, Amman, Jerusalem, Galilee, Nazareth, and then went back to um, uh, Amman, uh, Dubai, Beijing, back in Korea, stopped by in LA and stopped by in Greensboro, North Carolina. I came here and uh, it's been crazy. I don't know which, uh, which time zone I need to um, <laughs> settle down, but yeah, I've been to different places, but <clears throat> one place that I definitely want to return to, one place that I want to definitely live is, uh, is the U.S. because it's really comfortable here. And uh, I miss the time that I spent in the U.S. So um, I've been on the road for a while, but um, it's definitely good to be back. 
I must uh, uh, just warn you before I begin uh, tonight's message that uh, I spoke in Korean the last 10 sermons. So it's going to be a little bit of transition for me to actually come back into my English mode. So if I stutter or if I go slow, just bear with me. I'm going to get back into it in the next uh, few sermons. But by the time I get back, I have to preach in Korean again. So yeah, is, uh, is that even meaningful for me to return? Anyways, tonight, first of all, God tells us, prepare. How do we prepare? Stay awake until the end. And when Jesus comes, when Jesus returns, uh, he's going to look for one thing. Have you stayed awake or have you fallen asleep? As a church, have you stayed awake or have you fallen as a church? Have you fallen asleep as a church? And the question is, how do I stay awake? And in order to really examine ourselves, uh, whether, I, whether I'm staying awake or not, uh, there are three questions that I want you to ask yourself. Number one, have I, f- have I fixed my eyes on the eternal home? That's the question that I want, to ask, uh, that I want you to ask yourself tonight. Have I fixed my eyes on the eternal home? Or have I fixed my eyes on today, my life, the, 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 the tran- transitory home? Um, in, uh, according to verse 35, uh, the, uh, the Bible actually reads, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Stay, uh, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. And Jesus gathers his disciples and he says, You know what? There is going to be a time that the Son of Man will come in glory. And he's going to return. And that's going to be the time and hour that you, you do not expect. But until that day, stay awake. If you truly want to be saved, stay awake. And Jesus' disciples are probably wondering, how do I stay awake? And Jesus actually says, you know, gird up the loins and get your lamps burning. And Jesus', Jesus disciples immediately thought of one passage in the Bible. Because you've know, we got, you got to remember, Jesus is talking to the Jews. People who are very well uh, educated in, in Torah. What's happened in the Old Testament? When Jesus said these words, something triggered in their minds. And, because, uh, and that, that is the passage from Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. These are the words of Yahweh himself. On the night of the Passover, God himself calls his, his, uh, God, God himself calls his people. And he commands them to do this. I'm going to read this. And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Lord's Passover. God is telling his people, after tonight, I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to take you out of this land of slavery. I'm going to take you into uh, this long journey after after your uh, eternal home. I'm going to take you into the promised land. So tonight, the, the, the life of slavery ends. And starting tomorrow, it's going to be a new journey. So tonight, this is how you should, spend, this is how you should, you, you should be spending it. Pack up. Be ready to leave. And you're going to be starting on a journey. And this is how you should spend it. This is how you should, you should spend it. God is saying, whatever you're eating, eat in haste. Your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and that's how you should that, that that's how you should uh, spend your night. And God is telling you, God is telling his uh, his people, this, this this place where you're living is not going to be your eternal home. The place where you're living is not going to be a permanent life. You ought to be somewhere else. There's an eternal home waiting for you, and. The, the land of slavery will end tonight. The people that you see tonight, you will no longer see them again. And we're going to start this new journey. Stay awake tonight. Because if you fall asleep tonight, by the time you wake up tomorrow, everybody, everybody else is going to be gone. Just imagine yourself 2,000 years ago, uh, uh, many thousand years ago in that place. God telling you these, these things, how would you spend your night? Would you fall asleep? Probably not. You, you're probably, you know, just, you, you're going to probably spend the entire night trying to pack what, what to take, what not to take. What to take on this long road, uh, 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 road trip and what not to take on this road, long road trip. You're probably discerning what's permanent and what's not permanent. What's ultimate, what is not ultimate. What is eternal, what is not eternal. You're trying to discern where should I spend my energy? Where should I spend my strength? Where should I spend my time? 
You're, you're probably awake the entire night trying to discern how should I live my life? How should I spend the entire night in this last night in this land of, in land of slavery? And God, in many thousand years later, Jehovah himself, in flesh, he came in the form of Jesus Christ and he tells, tells his disciples, tonight, gird up the loins and keep your lamps burning. Which means the life that you're living is not going to be permanent. There's going to be a time coming that's going to uh, that's that's going to be uh, that's going to be a past pa uh, that that's going to be uh, see you know I'm, you know how I'm feeling. There's a linguistic warfare going on in my head. There's Chinese, Korean, Japanese, English. So there's ni hama kuni shou aniwa hello. Stop talking to me. So there's little voices speaking to me in my ears. So please bear with me. Anyways, so God is telling you. Um, and Jesus is telling his disciples, there's going to be eternal home waiting for you. And how are you going to live your life in this last day and age? Although it may seem very permanent, although it may seem very infinite, the life that you're so dearly clinging on to, it's going to end someday. Is it worth that much effort? Is it worth that much sacrifice? And God is telling you, this is time for you to choose. Because the life that you're living is not going to be permanent. There's an eternal home they're waiting for you. The life that you're living, the, the, the success that you're so much striving for, that's not going to be a permanent success. There's, because there's an ultimate judge coming. So unless you really fix your eyes on that ultimate thing, you're bound to fall asleep. I remember the time that I used to live in the U.S. Um, I was back in Chicago. And I don't know whether you can tell, tell or not, but I, I love shopping. You know, I, I love shopping. And I used to um, shop a lot when I was back in uh, my seminary days. And my, my favorite store used to be Banana Republic. And, uh, and don't judge me, but I, I would go into the Banana Republic, the BR store. You know, it's just like, the Banana Republic is just made for me. <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't even have to try on. The fitting room was just totally, uh, you know, it's just unnecessary for me. You know, I just I would walk in. I know exactly what I what I need. Size medium sweater, size medium T-shirt, 32, 32. I don't even have to try it on. I just walk in. I would look at the mannequin. I said, I want that. Just <laughs> strip it and just bring it home. And, and you know, back in Chicago, I, I was dreaming my dream car. Yeah, seminarians are supposed to be poor, but you know. You know, God gave me an opportunity to actually drive my dream car. You know what my dream car is? It's not Mercedes, it's not, it's not, Mercedes, it's not BMW. Uh, my, my dream car is actually a Jeep Wrangler. So living in Chicago, you know, taking the entire top down with those extra large tires, driving on the highway with a boom box, you know, making a lot of noise from the top. And then you're driving. If you're a Jeep Wrangler driver, you're not scared of anything. If somebody cuts you off on the highway, you just follow that person, all the way to the parking lot, you, you just park on top of it. <laughs> if you're a Jeep driver, you're not really afraid of anything. You know? You know, it's like one time I was driving on the highway, it started to like rain. I think it's Chicago weather, you just, you just can't expect anything. You know, weather changes are so often, you know, it happens so often. You know, sometimes, I, one, one time I was driving on the highway, it started to rain. And he's a Jeep driver, you're not afraid of rain. <laughs> so I busted out my, uh, you know, workout clothes. Took my goggles out, wearing my swimming goggles, <laughs> driving on the highway. And I was thinking that I was living a time of my life. But you know what? One day just occurred to me, and I, I believe this was the day that God called me out to the mission field. And I was um, actually um, trying to get dressed to go to work, to go to church. I opened my closet, and I realized every season I was trying to buy a new wardrobe. For example, a Banana Republic would say, uh, this season, uh, this fall, uh, blue's going to be the color. So you buy blue sweater, blue shirt, blue pants, blue t-shirt. They would say, this winter, the winter collection is going to be black. Black's going to be in this winter. So you would buy black shoes, black pants, black t-shirt, black sweater, black shirt. And I thought I was just busy doing that, busy doing that, right? One day I opened my closet and it just occurred to me, all the clothes that I have, Exactly same, just different colors. <laughs> exactly same V-neck Merino, Italian Merino sweater, just different color. And it just occurred to me one day, 
If I change my color 10 times, I'm going to be my 40s. Another 10 times, I'm going to be, I'm going to be my 50s. My life's going to be over. My life's all about changing colors of clothes. Wearing exactly the same clothes. And I was so stunned by that, I, stopped, uh, I stepped back and I looked at um, the car parked outside, right through the window, and I saw my car, my dream car, parked there, and I realized, until that day, I, I, I don't know why it, it didn't occur to me. On that day, I saw my car parked outside, it just occurred to me, that's not even my car. You know why? Because I got that car through a loan, so that car actually belongs to the bank. By, that by the time that I pay off the car payment, Finally, my car, but guess what? A new model comes out. I go back, I go, go into the store, I, no, not in the store, I go into the dealer, do a trade-in, I drive out a new car, that car still belongs to the bank. When you change your car five times during your 40s, when, you're, when you change your car another five times, it's, it's time for you to go home. I got scared one day. I was feeling, this is not the life that I want. Everything that I'm so dearly holding on to, all these things are just passing. All these things are just transitory. All these things are never permanent. But there's something that's uh, worth my effort, worth my sacrifice, and that's going to be the eternal home. And God is asking you that one question, are you staying awake or are you being just so completely absorbed by your daily life that you can't see what's really coming? What do you want with your life? Well, going to church, uh, going to college, marrying a perfect girl, having that American dream, you know, having a beautiful wife, nice job, nice home. And one, maybe one day I'm going to be really happy. And one day I'm going to die. I'm going to go to heaven. Is that the Christian life that you're dreaming of? God is saying, time for you to wake up. Amen. Number one, have I fixed my eyes on the eternal home? Or am I just being absorbed with my daily life? somehow believing that this life will never end. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, it's going to end someday. Number two question, how do I know whether I'm awake? Number two, am I ready to obey? Am I ready to obey? You know, a lot of us have these tendencies to really, you know, be absorbed into worship, and we, we just, you know, praise God, saying, you know, God, I'll do anything, you know, just like, you know, I want to I wanna surrender my life to you. But what if God really tells you tonight, surrender everything? What are you going to do? I've seen so many youth group students, you know, at youth conference or whatnot, and they say, you know, God, I want to give my life to you, you know, and I want to just, like, I want to die for you, I want to go out to the mission field, I want to just give, it, give up everything, and God tells you that night, give up your girlfriend. God, not that. <laughs> we, we say it so easily, but I'm going to tell you tonight, the word, stay dressed for action, that's actually a mistranslation. The actual translation, um, of, of the verse and of verse 35 is gird up the loins gird up the loins you know what that means be ready to serve you're ready to obey whatever God commands you you're ready to obey him girding up the loins means I'm ready to bring joy to your heart with through whatever means possible I'm, I'm ready to bring fulfillment to your heart Amen. that's what it means to girding up the loins and God is saying, you know how to stay awake? The way to stay awake in this last day and age is to be in the position of obedience. We don't fall asleep because we're not obedient. Uh, we, we don't fall, we, 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 it's the other way around, I'm sorry. We fall asleep because we're not obedient. It's not, because we've fallen asleep, we can't obey. Have you ever seen someone actually running a marathon and falling asleep? You know, you're, you're running, you're running, and you're running, and you're falling asleep. You don't, you don't really see that often, do you? A person somewhere along the way has lost the reason to run, and you're slowing down. That's when you start falling asleep. The reason why you cannot obey, no matter what he says to you, or says to you, the reason why you cannot obey is not because you have fallen asleep. It's because somewhere along the line, you thought, you know, what's the point of doing this? And you've slowed down. You've slowed down running the race. And that's why when God commands you something, you can't obey. You can't, you can't obey what, whatever he commands you. Tonight, I'm going to ask you, if you, I'm going to ask you to actually um, come and join the race again. If you come 
back to the place of obedience, and he's going to actually give you passion as well. Many of us, many of us have these tendencies to think, you know what, God, if you give me passion, and I'm going to obey. You know what that is? It's not, it's not obedience. You're, you're, you're dealing with it. You know what obedience is? Though you don't have any passion left in you, when God commands, because you respect what he says, because you honor what he says, you decide, you choose to obey him. That's what Christian life is. God doesn't tell you, you know, I'm going to give you passion, I'm going to give you everything, I'm going to give you tears, I'm going to give you burden, I'm going to just give you everything, and then I'm going to tell you to go and serve me. Who's not going to serve? Anyone can serve. But God is saying, you know what? Obey. I'm just, I'm just going to give you a small, tiny amount of obedience. Your ability to obey, your power to obey. I'm just going to give you a small portion of that so you can obey once. When you obey once, I'm going to, I'm going to fill you up with a little, more, a little more passion. Each time you obey, God's going to fill you up with passion. Amen. So come, passion comes after obedience. So brothers and sisters, for those of you that's waiting for passion, passion doesn't just come on one day. Passion comes as a result of obedience. So if somewhere along the somewhere somewhere along the way, if you have forgotten the way to obey, maybe you should look around and just examine yourself, and saying maybe somewhere along the way I've forgotten what you know, maybe a motivation to stay awake. God is God has become uh, and not in not, 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 he he's, he's no longer a good enough reason for you to stay awake. That's why you say you know what I'm going to slow down. You know, Christian life, this is good enough. I'm just going uh, to be satisfied with what I do with the church. I serve this much. God don't ask me, to, God, God, God don't ask me for more. And I go to Sunday services. I go do offering. I go out to the summer mission field. That This is enough. And according to my picture, this is a good Christian life. God, don't ask me for more. This is good life. You slow down. The moment you do that, you fall asleep. But God is saying, you know what? Come out from that. Wake up, and when you wake up, the only place that's going to keep us awake is a place of obedience. And God's going to challenge you one thing. Just like God woke Abraham up, he's got, God spoke to him. That's the day Abraham started to say, God, what did you say? He started waking up. On that day, what, what did God say? He actually gave him a chance to obey. Abraham, I'm going to ask you to leave your kindred. I'm going to, leave, I'm going to ask you to leave your home. Abraham was struggling. God, I won't even have that passion. But because you said so, I honor you. I will choose to leave. And he was still waking up. That's the first time God has ever, ever spoken to Abraham. Until then, you know, Abraham, he used to be like an idol worshiper. He was worshiping moon. But one day, this God called Jehovah, he, he decided to show up in Abraham's life and say, Abraham, I'm the real God. I'm going to ask you to leave your home just a chance, it's just a small chance for him to obey. What did Abraham do? God, I need to wake up a little more. You've got to give me more passion. Abraham did what? He obeyed. And Abraham, along the way of obedience, what, what, what did Abraham do? He was waking up from his sleep. So if you want to really, really wake up, I'm going to ask you to start obeying to him from the small things. God, I'm going to quit this. Tonight, I'm not going to do this. Tonight, I'm not going to look at this. Tonight, I'm, I'm not going to drink this. Tonight, I'm not going to smoke this. Small obedience will, will result in great spiritual gain. Amen. Number three. So number one, have I fixed my eyes on the eternal home? Number two, am I ready to obey? And that's the second question that you can, you can ask yourself to examine whether uh, you're awake or not. Number three, do I know who to look for? Do I know who to look for? You know, um, in verse 35 to 36, uh, the passage reads, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. You know what the interesting thing is? Many of us have this, um, you know, understanding that uh, the servant in the house, there's probably about 10 ser servants in the house, and the master of the house comes home, you know, late at night, say, open the door. And those, one of those ten servants are saying, okay, master, I know you. I'm going to open the door immediately. But you've got to understand the, the Jewish background. Do you remember one time that Abraham's nephew Lot was actually uh, kidnapped 
by the kings. And Abraham did what? He took 318 able men who can fight in the war. Those 318 servants that were born and raised in his, in his own household, he took, he took those 318 men over to, the war, uh, over to those kings to fight, fight against the kings to rescue Lot, his nephew Lot, out, out of their hands. Which means, for Abraham, it was not even 10 servants, it was not even 20 servants. The number of servants that were actually living in Abraham's home, just counting the ones that were born there, 318 of them, only men, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about men. 318 able men who are born and raised in Abraham's home, who can fight in war, warfare, 318, you know what that means? In his household, counting the female servants, little children, servants that he bought somewhere else, counting all those servants, there were probably more than 1,000 servants within the household. Which means certain servants have directly spoken to the master. Certain servants have actually seen the master, but certain servants, they've actually heard through other servants what the master is saying, but never really, they, they've never really had any kind of conversation with them. Certain servants, they've never even seen the master. They know what the master is like, they've heard about, it, they, they've heard about him, but certain servants have never seen the master. But now the master comes home from the wedding feast in the very late, uh, in the very, uh, very night, uh, late, late night, and knocks on the door. And Jesus is asking this question: Who is that servant who can open the door immediately? Who do you think? A servant that is never seen the master. Do you think that that servant is going to be able to open the door immediately? I don't think so. A servant who can open and accept the master coming, returning to home, returning home. That servant's going to be a someone who's familiar with the master. Even the, even the master comes home at very late at night, that servant is able to recognize the master right away. Out in the darkest time of the day, that servant is able to recognize the master. That kind of servant that we're talking about. You know, when Jesus comes, it's not going to be during the bright daylight. When Jesus returns, it's going to be the craziest time of the history, human history. It's going to be the darkest time of human history. And in the middle of that darkest time of human history, Jesus is going to return. And God is asking you, how are you going to live your last day and age? How are you going to be able to hold on to your faith? Are you going to be able to recognize the master when he comes? Well, I'm a Christian. Are you really? You know, I go to a lot of youth conferences. This is, this is what I find. Youth group kids are really, really smart. You know why? I know that there are a lot of youth group kids here. It's really smart because youth group students, you guys are amazing because I go to youth conference, three-day conference, and usually first day, you know, everybody's trying to get to know each other, doing little icebreakers and, you know, you know, who's cool and who's not, you know, trying to see who's possible girlfriend, who's possible boyfriend, <laughs> trying to gauge each other. You know, it's like that's what happens in the first day of the youth conference. But the second day, second night, second night, the last night of the youth conference, this is what happens. Youth, youth group students, this is, this is actually the reason why I respect you guys. You guys are so smart. Second night of the youth, youth, uh, youth conference, they know that they have to cry. <laughs> no matter who you are, you just know that you have to cry. Second night of the youth, com youth, youth, youth group conference. So what happens is, you know, the spotlight comes on and somebody plays a drum and guitar and, you know, all the lights go, go off and, you know, you, you feel this, you know, like, this emotional, uh, you know, something. I don't know what that is. You just, you, you just feel something. Everybody knows you have to cry. You start weeping and you start crying. And after that service, people get together and they start sharing during that time of fellowship. So what happened tonight? You know, the people share, I met Jesus Christ. He came to my heart. So passionate. But usually what happens is you know, they, they, stay up all, they stay up all night. They start talking, hanging out with each other, you know, exchanging email addresses and phone numbers, a cuckoo talk, whatever, or maybe you know, stay up all night. And the third day, they have the closing, the closing service. They go home. Everybody goes back to their own church. And after they get arrived in church, they go to probably uh, what McDonald's, one not to, to have a little fellowship to just finish it off. And they take their, take their backpacks and they go home. They drop it off. They lie down on their beds and they fall asleep. 
after taking a nap of what, for five to six hours, they wake up from their sleep, they're back to their old life. But what do they say? Oh, my spiritual life is so dried up, I need to go back to another retreat. They wait on another, uh, they, they wait on another retreat to come. You know what? They do this every summer, every winter, for six years. And by the time they graduate from high school and they walk to college, this is just in Korea, but I don't think there's a big difference between Korea and here. 80% of graduating seniors from high school, 80% leave the church. Why? They all said, I met Jesus Christ. They all said, I'm a Christian. They all said, you know, I've been blessed by God. But why 80% of them, they leave, they, they leave church after they go off to college? Why is that? Let me tell you why. Do you realize how much we're classically conditioned? We're no different. We're, in, in so many ways, we're no different from the Pavlov's dog. When the spotlight comes on, when you hear the drum sound, when you hear the music sound, everybody knows where to, when to raise a hand. Everybody knows when to jump. <laughs> Sometimes we don't even think about the words that we sing out. Do you really worship God, or are you just joking around and just classically conditioned and you're just acting out as you've been, uh, as you've been classically conditioned? Certain cues are going to make us cry. Certain cues are going to make us raise our hands. Certain cues are going to make us respond to certain ways. Are you really worshiping God, or are you, or are you just responding to certain cues? What are you doing? Well, I, I know Jesus Christ. You know what? When Jesus said, believe it in your heart and confess with your mouth, you know what that means? He doesn't mean, you know, just say those right spell. We're not doing Harry Potter here. Oh, I accept Jesus Christ. I uh, open my heart. I open my heart. Please come into my heart. You're my Lord and Savior. Uh, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, you're saved, brother. Just because you say the right words, does that mean that you're saved? When Jesus said, when, when, when the apostle said, Believe in your heart and you'll be, you'll, you'll, you'll be justified. And when you confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. You know what that means? He didn't speak to us. He spoke to the Jews in the early churches 2,000 years ago. You know what it meant for those people 2,000 years ago when the persecution was harsh? You know what it meant for them to actually confess Jesus Christ? In the early churches, when an early Christian said, I believe in Jesus Christ, you know what that means? It means I'm ready to die for him. I began to realize that Jesus Christ is actually the Messiah that I've been waiting for all along. I'm ready to die for. I treasure Jesus Christ and there's nothing else I want. When you believe in, believe in him like that in your heart, you will be justified. When you confess like that, you will be saved. But the Bible definitely is not saying say the right words and you'll be saved. We're not talking about some kind of computer programming. This is not a witchcraft. Just because you do this, just because you say the right words, that doesn't mean you're saved. That's why when Jesus returns, I do not know you. What did Jesus say? I never knew you. You know what's scary? He doesn't say, oh, today maybe I forgot. I can't remember. I can't recall exactly who you are. Does that, is, that, is that what Jesus says? Jesus actually says so bluntly, he says what? I never knew you, which means while you're doing that ministry, while you're out there doing that missions work, while you're serving the church, while you're attending church services, while you're offering me all those uh, offerings and tithes, I never knew you. I have nothing to do with you. It's a scary thing. I want you to really think about it. Many of us have this tendency to really believe, you know, we built our own religion thinking, you know, going to church, doing the offering, you know, uh, I, I do, I serve the youth group, I worship, you know, I marry a Christian sister, I'm a Christian, I'm saved. You know what that is? That's legalism. You've built up your own religion. We don't, be, we don't get saved in heaven and on earth. God has never given us any other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. Amen. You know what that is? Building your personal relationship with Him. You really know Him. And if you really know Him, if you really have encountered Him, when Jesus returns in the middle of the darkest time of history, you'll be able to recognize him. Otherwise, just becoming a church goer, 
you're going to be so deceived, you can't even tell what's the truth and what's not the truth. Who the real Jesus Christ is, who's not the real Jesus Christ is. You can't tell the difference. The question is, when I say these things, some, some people would ask, so how do you really uh, encounter him? How do, you, uh, how do I really know him? You know, what, you know what the Bible says? Pursue after him with everything you've got. As a deer pants for the water, my soul, what? Thirst for you. You know, those deers, you know, deer, what drives them is not manners, it's not religion, it's not some kind of framework of, you know, this is, I'm a deer, I'm, I'm really uh, thirsty, so I have to act a certain way. You're not driven by those things. As a deer pants, as a deer thirsts for water, my soul thirsts for you. You know what that means? I'm driven by my thirst. So it's the biggest task in your life that God's, God's onto. God's trying to make you realize that you're actually spiritually thirsty when your entire world, when your entire world tells you you're not thirsty, you're, you're self-adequate, you're self-sufficient, you, you've, got, you've got everything you, you need. But God is telling you over and over through difficulties and trials and uh, you're through your friends and messengers and pastors and so many missionaries, God is trying to do one thing. You know what that is? God is trying to become self-aware that you're actually thirsty. Because when you become real, when you, be, when you really begin to realize that you're actually thirsty, that's when the thirst will drive you crazy. And because of the thirst, that's going to become the driving factor of your life. You're going to start searching after God. God, I need you. I, I, I don't care what I do. I'm going, to, I'm going to go look for you. I'm going to pursue after you. And that pursuit will end with the knowledge of God. You'll end up meeting him. So the question is, have you really met him? Or are you just playing Christianity? Have you ever really encountered who Jesus Christ really is? Or are you acting like a Christian? Are you doing the Christianity, the Christianity that you've been taught and you're aware you, you, you're used to? Or have you really met the, the living Savior who died and who, who, who was risen for you? So those are the questions that I want you to ask yourself. Am I awake? If you're awake, you're going to fix your eyes on the eternal home. If you're awake, you're going to be ready to obey. In other words, if you're not ready to obey, you're, you've probably fallen asleep in your comfortable life. And do I know who to look for? If you don't know exactly who Jesus Christ is, did you, you know what the funny thing is? A lot of us have this uh, misunderstanding about Korea. But a lot of people think, uh, think uh, Korea is, is such a great Christian country, but they, they actually did a little uh, research recently. According to the research, 95% of Korean youth, 95% of Korean uh, church-going youth, 95% of them don't know exactly what the gospel is. 